This is the first video of a series of videos that I will be recording um, where I go a bit into detail on uh, what I'm doing um, in Fourth Moon and uh, which whistles I chose to play and how I play them. So here we go. This is probably by far the most popular of our tracks on YouTube. It's called Olympus. It has been originally composed for another project that um, myself and Fourth Moon's guitarist John DeMay have created together, which is called Event Horizon. It's a very lovely, very lyrical and poetic composition by Jean. And um, it's uh, inspired by uh, the whole concept we had around Event Horizon, which is space exploration and uh, cosmology. So Olympus Mons, of course, the highest mountain in our solar system, located on Mars, a really gigantic um, volcano. So here we go. This is the fourth moon version. Um, I played on an um, F whistle by Colin Goldie. These are really um, beautiful instruments, beautiful whistles. They come with their own challenges and I'll go a bit into detail um, over the course of the next videos on how to deal with some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that those whistles bring with them. So here we go. This is Olympus Mons. So let's look at this bit by bit. So the first bit that some players find a bit difficult already is um, that very first jump. So it needs a bit of conviction depending on which type of whistle you have um, to really do this octave jump cleanly without um, overdoing it so that you get a screechy thing like that's of course too much or not enough, which is when you get trapped in between the octaves a little bit. Of course, exaggerating here, but um, you need to really train those octave jumps. So I'll, I'll publish some videos on, on exercises, how to train those, that you hit the sweet spot um, when you do these kind of octave jumps between the notes. So you need to be knowing your instrument, of course, well, and know where the nice pressure is to get the nice sound. So here we go. So there's not much in terms of technique, but it, every little detail matters. So um, generally what I seek is a balance between legato moments, that means moments that are not interrupted by either some um, uh, tonguing or stopping of uh, breathing, um, and those staccato moments. So uh, there's, there's, there's always a bit of a game between what do I emphasize by making it cut, staccato, and what do I kind of link together and, and make it flow? Um, I'm very much influenced in this uh, by, of course, the playing of Brian Finnegan, um, who was also my teacher for some time um, while I lived in Limerick and was driving up to Armagh to take some lessons there. So um, you'll find a lot of that, uh, of course, in my playing as well, but it's uh, not quite the same in some details. And we'll go uh, over that also, over the course of the next videos. So, there is now um, a little thingy here, so... Which is tongue and then finger, of course, so... Not very difficult, very effective, you can use it everywhere. Also very basic, very simple. So it's a, it's a tap, 
spot um, preceded by a tongue ink and a cut. It just gives the whole thing a bit more shape. So here we go. So this up there, that's some basic triple tonguing. Um, there's several ways of doing it. You can say basically takata into the whistle, which is. So, um, when I do it, I find it very um, cut up. It, it, it's very sharp around the edges. Um, what I prefer to use and what I've learned um, from Brian Finnegan, uh, who learned it apparently from some people, some Bansuri players in India, uh, from what he told me, uh, is uh, Dadlda. So I say into the flute, makes it a bit rounder because the D, D, it's, it's just not as, tuk, as forceful. So, and I reach also quite a lot more speed by doing this. So instead of saying takata takata takata, I say it's much faster for me, you know? So. And you can also shape it in, in different ways, like quite soft or if you want to give it more emphasis. I prefer um, to start by having it laid out more soft and, and, and display a bit more control over this technique and then use it at some later stage in a repetition of the, the tune, for example, to um, emphasize it a bit more and give it more more shape around the edges as a variation, basically. So we go. Um, another difficulty that some players uh, find is with half holding. Um, it's basically just a training thing. You, you need to, it's like an intonation on uh, the fiddle, for example, uh, or any instrument where you need to in intonate it and, and find the, the right spot. It's quite hard on the whistle in, in faster tunes, and it requires a lot of, of training of your muscle memory, just knowing exactly the position of your finger that it needs to be in to get the right note. Um, for this particular note up here, there's two ways of, of getting that semitone. It's either that. But you can hear um, the tone isn't as clean there, I find, at least on this particular whistle. So I've just trained myself to do this instead. I find it cleaner and I'm just used to it. Um, you'll see, you have to see on your own whistle which one uh, works better for you. So, here we go. Here it's very important, it's like a, a sort of cran or doubling um, in the language of the highland piping, um, that you're very clean and, and don't rush this movement. You need to have always one of those two fingers firmly on the hole, on the whistle, it's just one finger at a time that moves ta 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 ta, and not ta la la, because then you'll you'll get something like. A lot of people get that instead of a very nicely defined. Really need to train your dexterity here, 
um, to get just two sharp duh, duh, that are separate from each other. You can't have um, them jumping about uh, with both fingers in the air at some point because that defeats the purpose of this ornament. So we go again. Here I like to give a bit more shape, for example, at the end, so that it's not just the same as the first time we played it. But it's just one way of, of, of putting some, some variation there. Um, and here I use a sort of um, long roll or whatever you call it, shake, uh, so it's Exactly, like that. Um, you can also use some triple tonguing to get a similar effect there, of course. Or combine the triple tonguing with a roll. That gets you a similar effect as well. Um, in some cases, uh, once you've mastered triple tonguing, it's a very effective but a bit cheap um, trick. You, you can substitute a lot of finger ornamentation with doing this triple tonguing roll. Um, you have to ask yourself whether you want to really do that because um, it it just if you do always the same thing um, it gets old after a while and if people are already expecting to hear the same ornament, the same kind of uh, aesthetic of ornament all the time, uh, you, you take a bit away of the creativity of your own playing. So um, despite you, you may be able to put some triple tonguing everywhere, uh, you have to kind of see how much you really want in your playing. I like in some tunes to have a bit more, in other tunes a bit less, it depends on the occasion. Um, but generally when I can do a very nicely executed finger ornament, um, I'd, I'd probably try and do that instead of supplementing it by some triple tonguing. So let's go once more slowly over the A part. There was a little variation there before as well, which uh, goes up. And here again we have one of those moments where it depends on your specific uh, type of whistle and the, the make of your specific whistle. So you can even have the same uh, a whistle by the same maker, by Colin Goldie. Um, uh, they all behave quite differently. They're master uh, and masterly crafted instruments, so they're, they're unique, each and every one and you need to find an approach. So even between two quite similar Colin Goldies, uh, I'll, I'll get a different response. And I need to play this one slightly differently than I play this one. So um, here again, intonation. Um, some whistles will demand a lot of pressure and will be prone to need to be overblown there. So it's, it's a question of playing them in also. So after a while with um, some sort of residue just from uh, condensation water etc from time from dust will settle a little bit in your fipple um, that will become a nuisance after a while so you need to clean that out um, uh, regularly but uh, when they're not brand new anymore uh, it means also some of the corrosion that just happens with the aluminum um, aluminium uh, will make it a bit easier tendentially to get certain notes and they will mellow out a little bit and not be as, as, as sharply screaming anymore. So that's what happened with that whistle anyway. I played this one since 2010, I think, or 11. Um, so it's aged and that changed the sound definitely. So if you are having a Colin Goldie F whistle, for example, and you're wondering why you're not getting the same result as me, or some other player um, that you like on some recordings that might be also down to 
uh, either the state of your whistle, either it's not well kept enough or it's too well kept even, uh, or the make of it or the particular uh, strength that Colin made it in. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, it's quite an important topic, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking a little bit about it here because uh, that's, that's a point where we need to talk about that. Um, when you have other whistles, for example, by other makers, it, you can have some whistles that uh, take a bit more air. It all affects the tuning. So you have some whistles that take a lot of air, don't have great tuning, and especially not in the second octave. Um, some whistles that don't take a lot of air, uh, but a lot of pressure. Uh, some that take n not a lot of air uh, and not a lot of pressure, that will be quite unstable. And ideally you want a whistle that takes just the right amount of pressure for, for you and the right amount of air for you to deliver some stable volume. It doesn't need to be very loud, but it needs to be stable. So you need to be able to have the lowest note, not like that. I'll blow it out a bit, but like that. You need to be able to lean into it a little bit. Same with one of the highest notes. Um, they need to come with a bit more pressure, but not like there shouldn't be a huge gap uh, because that makes more problems. So if I take another whistle, uh, this one here was uh, 3D printed. It's great. It has a lovely, really big sound in the first octave, for example. Very loud and nice sound in the second also, but it gets a bit hard up there. See, uh, once it breaks down, um, it takes a lot of air and not a lot of pressure uh, for the lower half, but it takes a lot of pressure for the upper half. So these are just factors that can influence your playing and that can be frustrating. Um, so I'm just uh, talking so long about this because I for sure was suffering from um, missing some information about all these things at the start and I thought that a lot of troubles I went through uh, were just purely down to myself, um, which should anyway be your first thought, uh, not blame it immediately on the gear. Um, but sometimes and to some degree the gear is really important as well. So some things you can not achieve with a certain whistle and um, you need to try a, around a bit, you need to get um, some data in for yourself of different makers and different whistles in order to get the result that you want. So I'm really happy with this F whistle, I've tried a few um, of different makers as well and I stuck to Colin Goldie, they're really what um, I play uh, the best on. So here we go into part B. So when I go into the part B, um, I change the expression a little bit there at the end of the A part. So I had a little bit of drama here, so it's like taking a bit of a dive there and um, give some more weight to the lower notes to then bring it up a little bit then again with some sort of swing. Because when we change from the A part to the B part, there's a bit of a change of mood. It goes from like some, some more lyrical um, sort of ambience, I find, to something more um, almost darker and uh, complaining in a way. So the story behind the tune is, is that there's a hypothesis that Mars might have had some sort of um, vegetation uh, at some point might have been greener than it was now and that through some cataclysm 
lost that. Um, I don't know. It's uh, just one of the hypotheses that floats around. Um, but uh, regardless of that, um, Earth might as well end up being a lifeless planet if we're not taking good care of that planet. So um, this kind of cataclysmic event that turns a planet hosting life into one that doesn't host life anymore can happen to ours as well. And that was a bit of the backstory to this tune. So there's explains a little bit the atmosphere there. And I find it's useful to know these things because you, you need to put some um, emotion into the tune. So here we go, change from A part to B part. Here again, I lean a little bit into the whole thing. And give it a bit of a swell there to add some drama. I'm overdoing it a little bit here now, uh, just to make it sure that everybody hears what I'm talking about. So then we have here a lot more triple tonguing um, in uh, basically between some notes, not just on one note to give it a, a, a triple triplet so, sort of thing, but also between notes to give it some texture. That requires a, a lot of training of triple tonguing and synchronization between your tongue, your mouth and your fingers. Uh, so here in this case it's It sounds more intricate than it actually is. It's just two taps with the tongue on one note and then the third one between the note and going up. So that gives it a whole uh, very virtuosic sort of sound while it actually is not if you look into the detail of it. And it's two times the same thing, the same trick here. So. Here again, here I use plain triple tonguing on one note to give it a triplet. We can also replace that by, by some, some finger ornamentation. So that is uh, an ornament basically taken from, from Highland piping here. It's called a shake. So it's um, like not too unsimilar to a cram, just with a tap instead of another uh, cut. So it's... Doesn't sound as brilliant, in my opinion, there, because of the second octave, the overblowing, etc. You can, of course, also combine a simple roll with some triple tonguing, which would render somewhat something similar. This was now without triple tonguing, of course. Uh, we'll do it again with some triple tonguing. So it's basically I'm putting the triple tonguing on. It's just giving a bit more. Um, uh, contour and shape I think to the ornament um, you can use it I wouldn't overuse it it's quite a nice uh, aug augmentation basically on just the pure triple tongue so so maybe at a later stage and a repeat of the tune you can use that in as a variation basically subtle one all right let's continue Here we come to a, a passage that is notoriously difficult, so um, I, I always train that a little bit before the gigs just to be sure to hit the intonation and to hit the, the semitone here, the half holding uh, right. Here 
here's the next um, tricky one. It's uh, basically like a short roll, uh, but with a with a cut in between, um, just coming down on this note here. So it's basically. So I come down, there's two ways. The weaker one is if you try it with that, with the ring finger, as I just showed earlier. Um, coming down from above, I find it more effective if I use uh, the index here actually. So. Yeah, so. Um, Again, it's a training thing. Uh, I find it works really nicely when you do it quite openly and um, very defined as well. So. That's another difficult one here. Here again, this the same trick. It's two turtle on one note, and then the other one, the third one, going in between, uh, changing notes. So you see, um, it's it's just you need to find a, a spot where your finger can lock into basically that you remembers that's always the same. So kind of a, a spot that you freeze into. I kind of cramp my whole hand a little bit, which is usually what you shouldn't do. Um, but it's like falling into a gear, like just moving the gear stick in in, in your car, and just have it always at the same point. So you remember the tension of your entire hand and the feeling where on the edge of the hole you feel the edge of the hole on, on your finger basically so it's just rolling off the hole and you feel where you have to stop not to open the hole too much uh, so so again here is a lot of ornamentation a lot of stuff going on Here I go back up with the same ornament we've seen before. So instead of doing as you would on the Highland pipes, for example, I use a, a tongue um, a staccato move basically just before the cut with the upper finger and the tap. Here again, see, needs constant training to hit it right. That's one of the, the most difficult parts in this tune, it's just to hit it right twice here coming from above. So it's, many of my pupils have a tendency then, me too as well, and especially at, uh, when, I, when I started playing this tune in this key, um, of cramping up a little bit here and having it uneasy. It sounds uneasy or not, not very clean. It's just one of those passages that you have to practice uh, repeatedly, uh, stupidly in a loop, just in order to get your, your muscle memory right there and in order to focus on relaxing wherever possible so that you're not um, in a kind of uh, rush, hurry and agony while playing this, this, this part. Because whenever you're in a kind of mental or, or physical agony uh, state uh, when, when playing a difficult part, you will tend to rush it. You will tend to just like um, rush over it and not sound very controlled. So um, exercise, repetition of that part, focus, playing it slowly, really understanding every single move your finger, your hand makes, being being aware of it is key for, for those um, uh, places. So...
And when I train these parts, I will also make sure that I play them relatively openly. Yeah, that I exaggerate some of the moves so that we get them nice and uh, relaxed after a while. All right, let's go over the whole second part once more. So, um, here was the segue into the A part again. Uh, what, I've, what I've tried to overemphasize a little bit here now is also some of the dynamic range. Um, we can play louder, we can play less, lou uh, less loud, uh, we can play with more uh, sort of wind sounds and with less. Uh, a lot of that is influenced by how we grab the fiddle, either with our teeth or with the teeth touching it, which gives a more clean sound. Uh, or if you don't touch with the teeth, it's actually because it's aluminium, it's a bit more healthy if you don't touch it too much with the teeth and have constant like little particles um, swallowed up. Uh, so I tend to not touch the fibble with my teeth. But it gives you a more mellow, a more sweet sound uh, with a bit more noises in there. Um, usually when you when you touch it with the teeth, you get less of that. So that's one of the major differences between Brian Finnegan's playing, for example, and, and my own, uh, because I, I'm, I'm asked always about that uh, comparison there. Um, he touches it, he, he almost munches away sometimes a little bit at the, at the whistle. So you can always identify uh, one of Brian's whistles by, by seeing on the fiddle here um, a lot of, uh, um, yeah, uh, sort of uh, part, little parts missing almost because of the, the way he plays um, very dynamically also here and uses also the, the grip with the teeth um, to influence the sound and um, I have not developed this habit so I have a, a, a bit a bit of a different sound when I blow into them. All right, um, what else is there to know? A lot actually. Um, so when when I go into this part I tend to go in strong and then take it back a little bit. So, so um, to really take it back and then swell on again. So to, to just give it more of this effect um, and, and drama, you know, in a way. I'm overdoing it, of course, here now. Uh, it, it needs to be more subtle in the final performance, basically. A lot of that um, expression and uh, dynamics have to do, of course, with the accompaniment, especially with uh, David David Lombardi's uh, fiddle playing um, and, and the chords he la lays over them and the swell that we have as a band all together. So, um, but, but it befits this tune quite naturally, so I, I probably do the same thing also if I play it alone, but um, it just really lends itself to that. Uh, it's really down to, to Jean's very lyrical uh, composing style uh, that we, we have a lot of, of these kind of tunes and these kind of melodies in our repertoire um, that just lend themselves to those those swells and, and, and slightly dramatic um, dynamics. Uh, what else can I say? You probably have a lot of questions still remaining. Um, 
I'm trying to think of of a few more things. Well, of course, there's the whole topic of variation, so I don't play it always the exact same in every gig. Sometimes I, I just change dynamic or expression. Uh, sometimes I will uh, have less triple tonguing in, in a performance if I feel like it, or sometimes more. Sometimes I will try to, if I feel like it on, on, on the evening, um, to, to play it more staccato altogether. Um, depends a lot on the band as well, because everybody has, has their own interpretation. Um, on, on any given night and how, how it gels together in the end. So I could also play it more like same as What might be interesting additionally to all of the aforementioned is that the tune Olympus was originally composed for Event Horizon and we played in a different key there um, and also with some different fingering and with all this comes a bit of a different expression but um, I'm going to play this quickly for you uh, um, not going into detail here we might look at that in, in another video but uh, also I'm going to use a D low D whistle here on the original recording I use an E flat whistle but since uh, not everybody out there has an E flat whistle and D whistles are more common I'm just gonna play it on the D whistle so that you can all follow easier. Here we go. <laughs> So um, there's another set of challenges there in this tonality. Of course, we have the E flat here, half holding the E hole here, um, <coughs> which is uh, akin to the I don't know the B flat hole basically in the other tonality. And we have a lot of octave jumps, octaving because it goes below the range of the whistle actually. So this tune was originally composed as a guitar tune. And um, that's why it goes actually below the range of the of the whistle that it was originally played on. And um, yeah, in fourth moon we just changed the tonality, made it brighter, made it uh, sit on a, on another whistle, and um, so the the bottom notes are no problem. Like here, for example, when you have to jump. <laughs> Uh, I like both. I'll leave you uh, the link to both versions down in the infos and um, leave me a comment. Let me know which one rings more through to you, which one you prefer. And um, yeah, also if you learn these tunes, either version, either tonality, I'd be more than happy to uh, get a reaction video and uh, see you play it. And, um, and, and get some feedback also on how you find the usefulness of such videos and if I could answer some of the questions that were out there on the internet. Thanks a lot and uh, yeah, I, I think <laughs> uh, maybe see you around at the next ones. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'm doing a whole 
host of videos like these, uh, maybe going a bit more into detail, maybe over the course of time getting a bit more uh, better gear to record as well and, and, and get the sound a bit better um, through to you. And this will be mainly on my Patreon page. Because I'm a professional musician, I of course need to also be able to make a living from my music. So I um, provide this as a service and I would of course be happy for everyone that wants to support me for a wee while and uh, find it useful that I make these videos. And so long, I say until the next one and I hope that the music reaches you.